Well, I, I've heard that everyone this morning has complained that when they were asked to uh, speak about the topic about theory of the case, that very little is written on the subject. And I discovered the same thing when I was preparing for this lecture. So um, to, the, to the best of my ability, I'm going to try to refer to some examples this afternoon uh, to best illustrate um, the theory of the case and how you might consider using it in discovery. But um, there are many uh, media images today of the trial lawyer. And there are many different examples that you see on TV of the aggressive, skillful criminal lawyer in the shows like The Practice and Law and & Order, and the scattered, flighty uh, lawyers that you see on Ally McBeal, the civil lawyers. Um, in most instances, uh, it provides good entertainment. But uh, an effective courtroom advocate is not always uh, an aggressive litigator or an entertaining uh, person. Not everything about a case is interesting, riveting, or dramatic. TV and the media leave out the mundane details of preparation of a case. In every instance, the trial lawyer is portrayed primarily as the performer for the jury, for the audience, for the TV audience. What is ignored is the tedious, routine, time-consuming preparation demanded to bring a case to trial. However, preparation makes for boring TV, yet Thorough preparation is what makes a case, and nothing can replace that. The litigator prepares and present, presents the case for trial, and although preparation and presentation at trial involves a different skill set than discovery, preparation in discovery is inextricably linked to the success or failure of your trial. The better the preparation, the better the presentation. Of the two, preparation in my mind is more important than presentation. However, if you can do both, you're more likely to succeed. It is especially true for the beginning litigator where meticulous preparation can make up for courtroom inexperience. And good acting cannot salvage a poor script. Good trial uh, presence cannot save a poorly prepared case. And through preparation, you can overcome these inadequacies. The long and the short of it is that you must be prepared for an examination for discovery. The half hour looking at the brief, uh, looking at the pleadings, and walking in with some sketchy outline for discovery just won't do it. As you are aware, you only get one chance to examine the opposing side for discovery, and with that one chance, you have to use the information obtained to prepare for the trial. In preparing for your discovery, you have to develop a theory of the case. You don't wait for the trial to provide you with your theory. In essence, you have to be prepared to paint a picture to your adversary of the most plausible explanation for the facts and theory of the law in the case. Well, what is the theory of the case? Um, the theory of the case is essentially your game plan. It's the basic underlying idea that explains not only the legal theory and the factual background, but ties the evidence together and into a coherent, credible, and plausible story. The best theories of the case are the most simple. And how is the theory of the case different from the theory of law? Well, theory of the case, as I stated previously, takes into account the facts and the underlying motives, perhaps, of the parties at issue, and does not just simply look at or consider the theory of law. Another word for theory of the case is the theme. What's the theme of your case? You should keep that in mind in preparing for discovery. Um, given that discovery is limited to the issues raised in the pleadings, it is essential that the legal theory be formulated early on in the case. However, given that new facts and new evidence are discovered along the way, your theory has to be fairly flexible. You have to be prepared to discard a theory with respect to a particular fact or modify it. And if I could give you an example. An example could be a situation where you have a contract. Both parties sign the contract so there can be no issue with respect to that point. However, one party, the supplier for example, might be alleging that a material fact was misrepresented to them being who they were contracting with. If they later discover that the, the company whom they contracted it with is sold to a third party, they complain. Had they known about this fact, they would not have entered into the contract. The contracting party, their theory of the case may be, well, we didn't anticipate selling to a third party, or we didn't think those negotiations would culminate in a deal. 
However, if the documentation through the discovery process and through your examination of witnesses suggests otherwise, for example, suggests that they were in heated negotiations with a third party to sell the company while they were negotiating with a supplier, then that theory is not plausible. However, another theory that may support your position if you're defending the misrepresentation claim may be, well, the, f the fact of the identity of the contracting party is not material because the supplier never complained about it in the weeks and months that passed the sale of the company. And so you really have to look at the facts to develop your theory, and they have to be consistent with the documentation and the evidence. And you will always find that throughout the discovery process, there will be facts and evidence that you'll discover along the way, and so you'll have to be flexible. Well, how you develop the central thing? Well, first of all, you have to gather the facts. Consider what the applicable law is and assess your opponent's theory of the case by looking at their law. You must also consider how different theories will impact upon one another. Sometimes a theory of a case may be inconsistent with one another. Um, an example of an inconsistent theory is in the case of, this is a criminal case, of Leary versus the Queen. This was a rape case. And in this case, the accused defense was consent. He gave a statement to the police describing an act of consensual intercourse. However, on appeal, it was argued that the defense's um, drunkenness ought to have been put before the jury. Mr. Justice Pigeon commented that in, in responding to this theory, an accused cannot very well at the same time ask the jury to believe his statement that the complaint did, complainant didn't consent if at the same time, he says he was so drunk as not to know what he was doing. And that's the point. Your theories of the case have to be consistent. One powerful example of the use of the theory of the case I found was when Exxon successfully sued Lloyds of London with respect to an insurance policy for reimbursement, they were claiming, for the $2.5 billion they spent cleaning up that oil spill in Alaska. Despite the fact that the trial took place in the United States, they were very worried uh, that even though it was a foreign insurance company, that everyone had been so angry at Exxon that they would somehow be punished and would not be successful with their suit against Lloyd's, London, Lloyd's of London. And Lloyd's raised a number of defenses. Essentially, their theory of the case was that Exxon was so reckless. You may recall that uh, the spill was caused because uh, the captain of the ship was uh, in his cabin intoxicated when the event occurred. And so they basically said that Exxon was so reckless that they had intentionally caused the spill, and therefore they should not be covered. Um, in those circumstances, what defense counsel did, and this was consistent with, was, with what was done at Discovery, is they acknowledged Exxon's responsibility. They didn't deny it. They uh, explained the steps they took in helping to prevent this disaster. They paid $2.5 in cleaning it up. But they said, look, and, and I quote here, the buck stops here. We're responsible for this spill. Captain Hazelwood was responsible. He was the captain of the Valdez, and it was his crew that didn't make the turn. He worked for Exxon Shipping, and it was their boat that ran aground. We own Exxon Shipping, so we are responsible for what they did, and it was Exxon's oil that spilled. The whole mess is our responsibility, and the buck stops here, and that is why we need insurance. And at the end of the day, they were successful. The point of the matter is that you have to develop your theory of the case early on because you don't want your witness during the discovery to be denying liability in a case where, at trial, you don't intend to deny liability, but you intend to take the position that you acknowledge liability, but are counting on your insurance, you have a contractual right to the insurance, and you're entitled to be paid for the monies expended. So the point is, don't wait to the 11th hour to develop your theory, because you'll end up with inconsistent evidence at trial. Some other examples may be the case where you're acting for an insurance broker, for example, and the insurance broker is being sued for an alleged failure to discuss and disclose the terms of an insurance policy, like an environmental exclusion. 
And if that insurance broker is acting for a company, let's say a painting and decorating company, and, and that insurance agent knows the painting company has to dispose of paint and chemicals, um, the issue may be in that case, well, did the insurance agent talk about environmental coverage? Um, in that case, if you're acting for the broker, you may claim that these issues were discussed and that the insured rejected the coverage. But often you will find that the documentation is not consistent with this defense. What do you do? Well, you'll have to develop another theory of your case. Perhaps after speaking to your client, you determine that this company is small and could not afford environmental insurance. You might want to consider hiring a, an expert to provide evidence as to the cost of such insurance, cross-examining or the witness at trial and examining at discovery the painting company on the issue of what insurance have they received in the past on environmental that provided them with environmental coverage, um, what money were they prepared to pay for such coverage, what had they paid in the past for their insurance, issues like that. If you don't identify your theory of the case early on, you might not even consider questioning along those lines at discovery and you'll end up going to trial not knowing what the answers will be if you pose those questions to the, um, to the opponent blind. So it's very important that you develop these theories early on so that you can base your questioning on them. Sometimes your theory of the case will be more dependent um, upon the law than the factual underpinnings of the dispute. Um, an example may be uh, an accountant's liability case and where you have unsophisticated investors, they've lost a lot of money, and they're looking for someone to blame. Who can we blame? So they sue the lawyers and the accountants uh, who acted on the deal and they're looking for some damages. What do you do as defense counsel? Well, you know it's not going to be particularly persuasive to a trier of fact if you attack these unsophisticated investors. But it may be that your accountant in this case, all they did was prepare what you call notice to reader statements. And your expert tells you that there's a very low level of liability or duty owed to an investor um, from an accountant preparing and compiling financial information. Knowing that, you will go into discovery proving that these, or attempting to prove, that these individual investors did not look at the financial statements, did not talk to the accountants, did not in any way rely on the financial statements, but instead perhaps entered into the investment based upon the advice of friends or others. And at trial, your main focus will be arguing the legal issue of the accountant's liability. So again, in this case, it's important to identify the theory of the case um, for yourself and asking opposing counsel and also for the sake of your own clients so they know going into discovery uh, what questions are going to be posed to them, what kinds of topics are going to be covered and what position they should take in response to those questions. In some cases, documents may not come into play at all and these kinds of cases in examination for discovery are very rare. However, one example may be where you're acting on a slander case and you're acting for someone who's being accused of harming someone's reputation by making defamatory remarks. What do you do when there's very little documentation? How do you prepare the theory of your case? How do you prepare for the discovery? Well, of course, you have to speak to your client. Get the facts of the case from your client, first of all. If there are any witnesses, that the client thinks might be able to shed some light on it, speak to them. Do your homework before the discovery. You might also wonder, well, what's the underlying motive for an attack like this? You should ask your client what the relationship the client has with the accuser, if any, and often you'll find there was a prior relationship, a motive for the lawsuit. Interview as many people as you can before you conduct the discovery, and you'll be able to put questions to the witness the deponent being examined about, uh, about uh, the situations or conversations they had with other witnesses and get their response, get the information before trial. When 
us to remember what are the purposes are of our discovery before doing an examination for discovery. And one of the principal purposes in my mind is not only to obtain admissions, distill the opponent's theory, but is to eliminate surprise at trial and to narrow the issues. Well, how do you do that? How do you eliminate surprise at trial? You can't forget the, the uh, use you put to an examination for discovery transcript. Essentially, the transcript belongs to the examining party. It's you that can use the transcript at trial. You can choose to read the transcript in or not. And in that sense, it's my view in any event that it's the time to ask what you might view as the riskier question. Ask the questions to get the other side's theory of the case, to get their evidence on key issues, so that when you're going into trial, you're not surprised. How does your client fit into your theory? Well, the first thing is you have to speak to your client to get the facts of the case. But the other fact is you should not ignore the background of your client or who your client is. If your client is a sophisticated person who's had a lot of dealings um, with other companies, you can't take the position at trial or even at discovery that your client was not sophisticated, was not well advised prior to entering into a contract. So always consider who your client is, what your client's relationship is with the opposing party in distilling the theory of your case. Sorry, I just lost my, my place here for a moment. What questions do you ask on discovery? It is not always necessary or best to conduct an examination for discovery in a logical order. On the other hand, chronology of events is often very important, but if you're trying to flush out the opposing party's case, it is sometimes useful, in my experience, to extract truth and ascertain credibility by asking questions which cover topics in random order because often when you do this, you can distill the credibility of the opposing party. You should never waive discovery of documents, and you should use documents when conducting an examination for discovery. Uh, you should ask for, example, all production of all electronic documents, because often that provides you with key evidence in attacking the credibility of a case. Of, of, a, of a witness. And there are examples where electronic evidence has been used to support the theory of the case. And one example was the criminal case which took place in Los Angeles where an email that was produced by the LA Police Department basically uh, said, oops, I haven't beat anyone so bad in a long time. And that was the Rodney King case that was very notorious and that document essentially killed the police, uh, police's case in that matter. Sorry, I'm feeling a bit ill, so I have to take a moment. Sorry, I'll have to take a moment. I've got a bit of the flu, so... formally has something to, to say briefly, so I'll, I'll put her up. Right. Well, um, I, I thought instead of talking to you about um, abstracts and so forth, about theory at pretrial and trial and mediation, um, that I would speak to you about a live case that I got to live with for eight years and um, explain um, our theory of the case. And so what I was going to do was ask that the videographer uh, pause the... Uh, the camera and that everyone pick up um, a sample case which have the full facts of the case. The case went to trial, it went to the Court of Appeal, we prevailed at the Court of Appeal. You'll find no names uh, to protect the innocent um, with respect to which case this is and there's a sample document that was one of the do 900 documents at trial and I want to sh have you read it and then go through this with you as to um, how we identified our theory of our case early on and thought we had the right theory. Um, and at trial, um, something snuck out and bit us on the butt. So 
if you want to get those documents and take a look, then we can resume and my colleague can finish her, uh, her part of the case if she's feeling better. from uh, the bench. little as possible. However, in situations where your witness appears to be troubled by the questions, doesn't understand them, or perhaps needs some time to think about them, it's often a useful tactic to object to the question posed as counsel representing the, the witness, and it gives uh, the witness time to think about their answer, and also the witness can then hear from opposing counsel as to why the question is relevant. And that may give the witness some time to think about their answer before answering the question. Similarly, counsel will often use that opportunity to say, well, we don't know the answer right now, but we'll undertake to provide you with that answer. 
that can be useful uh, for the council giving the undertaking to buy them some time to, to put their answer in a way that best fits into their theory and basically in the best possible light for their case. However, as opposing counsel, you don't have to accept that. You're entitled to get the best answer that the witness can give that day and say if they need to provide further information, they can do so by way of undertaking. Sometimes if the opposing side doesn't understand the theory of their case, their evidence, it's a good opportunity you can use to ask several questions to get them to provide undertaking answers on the basis that, well, they, it must be relevant, but they really don't know, but they'll undertake to give you the answer. And then the other party's bound to answer the question. And that's a, often a useful tactic where the other side has obviously not prepared for their case and really doesn't understand where you're going. And if, if that's the case, then you can use this tactic to gather additional evidence that otherwise might not be available to you. You are also entitled to ask questions regarding facts or relevant legal uh, arguments or documents that support a party's position. For example, some people, rather than developing a theory of the case, produce a whack of documents in no particular order, not properly identified, and when reviewing the documents in preparation for discovery, you're looking through them and you don't even understand the relevance of the document to any issues set out in the pleadings or to the case. You're entitled, as counsel, to ask questions with respect to those documents. For what purpose are you relying upon this document? Identify the documents that you're relying on in support of this issue, and counsel on the other side is bound to answer the question. They can't give the answer, well, we're relying on all of the evidence provided to date and all of the documents that are set out in all of the affidavits of documents. That is not an appropriate answer, and you're entitled to a more specific answer. And this is particularly important, as I say, in situations where counsel are trying to use the uh, bury the opponent approach to litigation. And often that approach is taken in cases where liability or the theory of the case might be difficult to identify. An example may be you're acting for a plaintiff who has built an apartment building. That apartment building is sinking into the ground. The plaintiff had hired a number of contractors and experts to do the work. And uh, it is difficult for the plaintiff in that situation to identify who the wrongdoer was. However, if you're acting for the defendants, it may also be difficult to identify precisely who contributed to the problem. Um, you'll have to acknowledge that there is a problem, the plaintiff's not liable. However, who may be liable for the problem may be difficult to discern. In those circumstances, plaintiff is often faced with uh, opposing co-defendants who bury the plaintiff in, doc plaintiff in documentation, um, and the plaintiff has got the uh, problem of discerning who is responsible and to what degree. Uh, the defendants, defendants in those cases often point fingers at opposing co-defendants without really providing a theory of the case in terms of who could have contributed to this problem. And it's in those circumstances where it's very important to be able to identify the documents and the evidence to each particular party that relates to the issues in that case. Should you cross-examine a discovery? Is that a good way of flushing out the theory of your opponent's case? In my experience, that's not a really successful way of obtaining the evidence. Um, Cross-examination may be useful to obtaining key admissions, but you can often put the witnesses back up, put their guard up, and they'll be less likely to cooperate and provide you with the evidence you need. Um, the other point is, should you ask colorful questions? Should you accuse the witness on the other side of being a liar, of not telling the truth? I've seen that done by very experienced counsel, and I've seen it backfire. Um, if you're going to do it at all, you should do it at the very end of your examination for discovery when you've had the witness's cooperation on key points. Um, the, is it useful for doing it? Are you going to get a useful admission that you can read in at trial that will fit within the theory of your case? I don't think so. If anything, it'll put the witnesses back up. Um, you will prepare the witness for the trial so they'll be very prepared as to what situations they can expect to face at trial. 
and in my experience, that kind of tactic is better saved for trial than in a situation where it is totally justified based on the evidence, the documentation, and the witness's demeanor in responding to the questions put. Difficult situations can arise at discoveries. Some lawyers are always late for an examination. Um, some try to uh, abuse the process by refusing to answer proper questions, particularly where they're facing inexperienced counsel. You shouldn't be deterred by this fact, and in fact, you should, sorry, you should always remember what the theory of your case is, insist upon answers to questions to questions put, and basically remember that everything is being recorded on the record and can be used in a motion or at trial. So never say anything or have your witness engage in banter with the other counsel because that can be used against your witness and your client at trial. Should you ask questions about the, that, that distill the theory of your case to the opposing side, is that something you should do on discovery? In my mind, it's something you must do on discovery. Um, the reason is the issues are going to be set out in the pleadings in any event. Good counsel should be able to distill the theory of your case just from reading the pleadings. A simple example can be a case where a company has painted uh, the equipment of another company. The paint peels, the company sues the plaintiff, the defendant company for the paint job done. The obvious questions of the company being uh, sued to the plaintiff are when, when did the peeling occur, what, what costs have you incurred in repairing the peeling, things of that nature. However, an obvious question is also the defendant's theory of the case, which may be there was, an, there was a burst in the pipe, there was a, an explosion of some sort that caused the paint to peel. And they may have a reason or basis for that belief, having talked to witnesses, having talked to perhaps a disgruntled employee at the plant. And therefore, it is important to ask those kinds of questions on discovery to obtain the evidence because you're going to need it at trial. And in my mind, it's not uh, a danger. In fact, it's a danger not to do so. So I see it as having no harm identifying your theory of the case at discovery. After all, you're not just trying to win the case at trial, but you're trying to settle the case as early on as you can for the sake of your client. And that's about it, unless anyone has any questions. Yes. Back and forth, back and forth in the normal course of facilities. Mm -hmm. And those are being discussed. And they create a climate <coughs> that would seem to be unruly and a casual about serious matters. And so, if, if, but if the lawyer comes in late, you come in with the emails staring at you. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. Well, they're often a very good source of evidence for that reason. People tend to communicate via email in a very casual manner. And as, as you know, backup tapes are kept of all of the electronic data. And so often it can be used. It's a very, very useful source of information. I find that to be the case. Um, there's not a lot you can do about it. If the client creates the document, they've got to live with it. <laughs> Yes. Well, that's correct. I think it really depends on the facts of the case. I was involved in a case where the other side wanted all of the backup tapes. And of course, with all of the backup tapes, you're going to have evidence that, and documentation that has nothing to do with the case at issue. And it's going to be confidential business information. So there are limits. In that case, um, I just kept. Uh, I'll tell you what I did in that case. I just kept refusing to give it over, even though I was ordered to do so, at, and until it came apparent to the uh, to the trier of fact that they weren't relevant. And because we had produced 
and then made an effort to produce all of the electronic documentation relating to the issues, and we had done that, the court didn't go the extra step. But it's a risk. I'm not advising you to ignore a court order, but um, I'd say that's the rare case where they would, they would order that. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. I'm, I'm grateful. We're all grateful that you uh, soldiered on. Um, in connection with what uh, this gentleman said, I have one client who um, said something that stuck in my mind many years ago. He was a man of, um, shall we say, on the fringes of a regular commercial business. And he said, whenever you're talking to anyone, remember you're talking to the world mm -hmm. and never put it in writing. So tell your clients, seriously, tell your clients. Remember, an email is the same as a letter. Well, as it did in the uh, L.A. Rodney King beating case, same thing. That's a killer email. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. I personally haven't experienced it. Um, I think it would be a very rare case where, it, because it's particularly intrusive, um, I, I'd see that as a particularly rare case. Uh, I, I'm not aware of a case where that's been done personally. Anyway, once again, many thanks, uh, Karen. Um, our next speaker is Elaine Gray of the uh, Gowlings Fund. advocacy group doing commercial and insolvency work, uh, the author of uh, Interlocutory Proceedings and Practice and Procedure, and is presently working on a text, I think, for this coming year, 2000, on uh, bankruptcy and bankruptcy practice. And uh, Ms. Gray is going to be speaking to us about uh, theory of pretrials and mediations. Ms. Gray. Well, thanks for the kind words. Whenever I hear something spoken about me, it's like how I feel when I read the student resumes for articling and imagine these people must be uh, geniuses, uh, which um, when I meet them, they are, but in my case, I'm not. So um, pretrials and, and mediations, I'm going to divide them up to speak about them. And pretrials are, are an animal that has sort of been long underused and underestimated um, in the... Uh, the early days of my practice, we used to go to pretrials on uh, personal injury matters and other matters. I did employment law early on. And it was just sort of another step in the procedure that you, you went through the motions of doing and you really weren't um, hoping to achieve that much with it because they just seemed to be sort of a rubber stamp type process. You'd go in, oftentimes people wouldn't have exchanged their pretrial conference memorandum, uh, memoranda, and you'd go in, um, you know, you'd sit down and hear some war stories from the judge and, you know, uh, you'd leave and you'd have no better idea about whether you had a good case or a bad case or what the other side was thinking or if settlement was a good idea or if there was any interest. Um, and it was the rare case that um, was treated in a more uh, diligent manner, which I think has become more the practice um, now than, you know, 15, 14 years ago. Um, and I found pretrials to be particularly useful, but also a scary adventure because the particular file I handed out, or the case I handed out to you is, is a case in point. Um, we thought that this case was all about whether we had obtained a further written agreement. And if you go to page two, the overholding provision that 
governed the relationship from the parties going forward from the end of um, April 1991 was this overholding provision. And we thought as long as we could demonstrate that there was a further written agreement, that was the end of the story. We had a further written agreement. It was for a month to month tenancy. We had some you know, sporadic negotiations for a lease for a term of years. Those were not concluded. We gave proper notice as a month to month tenant and we left and we thought that was appropriate. And just uh, to be on the safe side, we offered some extra month months notice to the landlord to s try to sweeten it and keep everything um, uh, copacetic. Um, so the whole focus of the case through the discovery process um, was in as regards this further written agreement. And as you can see, there, there was a letter that was sent. Um, that's the letter that's referred to at, tab, or at um, paragraph 8, in which the landlord, subsequent to the expiry of the, the lease for a term of years, wrote and confirmed the new terms of the new lease for different square footage at a different square rate per, uh, a different dollar rate per square foot. Um, and we got admitted at, in discovery and at trial that this letter was received by our people, that uh, we signed it and sent it back saying, okay, that the landlord received it, that it had been sent out and all the stuff that I put in this, that it was sent out with the intention that we should rely on it, that we did rely on it, and we thought, okay, so where do we go from here? Well, they changed counsel just before the, tr the pretrial. And um, I, I sent along a colleague of mine to, to, to do the pretrial. And we had an offer on the table of about, I don't know, 90. They wanted 120. We weren't very far apart. And we figured, well, we'll go to the pretrial and hopefully we'll um, get closer instead of farther apart. So um, my colleague goes to the pretrial. We get a judge who says right at the beginning, I haven't read the materials, but what have you got on the table to my colleague? And my colleague says, 90. He says, well, you should have about 150 on the table. Okay, fine. You know, that's, that was our maximum that we were prepared to go to, but my colleague didn't say anything. And he turns to the plaintiff's counsel and says, and you, on the other hand, you should be looking for 250. So, you know, my, my young colleague scratches his head and thinks, woo, this, this isn't good. You know, he's sending the parties further apart and he's giving no explanation as to why he thinks that. So the pretrial lasted about eight minutes sending my colleagues scurrying to the washroom, hiding from plaintiff's counsel because we did have an offer on the table and they had an offer on the table for 110. So he knew wisely that he should try to avoid this guy so that he could call me, I could phone, get our client to accept the offer and we'd be out of there fine. Having had this very bizarre pretrial with uh, you know, the judge going in two different directions, directions as to what the, the damages would be. So um, in the meantime, this guy follows him into the washroom waits for him to come out of the cubicle and says, I'm formally withdrawing my, uh, our offer to settle, and here he scribbled out a note, you know, withdrawn. So my colleague comes back and he's, okay, what, what are we gonna do about this? And I say, well, let's not panic, you know, we go through everything again, we work up our, our theory of our case, we have several other partners in the office go through the facts, and okay, well, you know, it seems like a pretty solid case. All we had to do was prove that we had a further written agreement. Everyone's gonna say we had a further written agreement, great. So we get to trial. All along, we had heard nothing about this particular document that I handed out to you. This was one of 900 productions. Um, the, uh, the, the chap on the other side, very cleverly realizing he didn't have a good, um, uh, legal theory of his case and that we, we clearly ha had demonstrated a further written agreement um, leapt on to this stalling language used in the last paragraph of this internal memo and taking it completely out of context managed then to persuade her honor at the time that my client was evil and had been stalling and this was bad faith this was not anywhere in the pleadings this was nothing that had been discussed at discovery never heard of this he stood up at this, and lo and behold, the trial judge just was besotted by this argument. She thought it was wonderful. Okay, so we have, we're acting for the big corporate evil giant who was stalling in bad faith with this poor little landlord who, in fact, had probably more net worth than either of um, uh, the two companies that um, I had been retained by. And um, it, so, so we lost at trial. 
And it, bizarrely, she found that there was a further written agreement, but she called it something else and said that it wasn't sufficient just to have a further written agreement. You actually had to have had a formal lease for a term of years. Well, you know, I went back and I looked at the term of the, the lease and I say, look, it only says, you know, but without any further written agreement. So to me, that doesn't mean we had to have a formal lease for a term of years. And anyone who practiced in, in, in commercial real estate knows that they're, you know, two different animals, very distinct. So, you know, we went to uh, Chris Pallier, who's our senior appellate advocate. We went through the facts with him, and he looked at it all and said, yeah, don't get it, you know? It's a very Chris-like uh, mannerism. Uh, so he agreed to take on the appeal, and um, we, we got to the appeal court, and uh, they decided, this is my, my colleague on the other side, decided to bring in his big gun, and so, you know, we both put our big guns up to the Court of Appeal. And the big gun, instead of dealing with the facts, which Chris did, and established this whole theory of our case on a very legal, uh, in a very legal approach, um, started slamming the client and going on and extrapolating from this stalling thing to take some of the lovely language her honor had used in her reasons uh, to try to create this image of you know the the equities and and our client wearing the black hat. Well. Fortunately for everyone, that's not how it went, and it ended up with um, us paying exactly what we thought we would have to pay, and you know the matter has, has now thankfully gone away. But this document was examined by both parties um, in the context of discovery, and uh, it came as quite a shock that um, you know, even though we hadn't heard anything about the theory of the case from the other side when the new counsel came on, um, the, the, his theory of the case prevailed at trial. And it wasn't a legal theory, it was an equitable theory. So I guess what, what I'm suggesting is that at pretrials, you might not only want to consider um, what your, your legal theory of your case is, but um, similarly what equities could, um, could come up to bite you um, in the event that someone took um, an odd document and extrapolated forward to say, you know, your client isn't worthy to to win the case despite the technical advantage. And it sort of goes back to the, this chap in the second row's comments about, you know, bad emails. Those are becoming more and more prevalent. And my view on bad emails would be to try to um, contextualize those as just that, that, you know, uh, they are used in a more uh, casual manner and it's not the same as, as the type of letter where your um, more weight should be given to it and so forth, but um, I certainly would look for this type of wording or language in the future to suggest that um, despite having a good legal theory of my case, um, if there's an equity there that, uh, uh, that uh, can prevail, it might prevail. Um, so all of that to say that when you're preparing for a pretrial now, I'd recommend that everyone do a very good comprehensive pretrial memo that sets out the theory of the case, sets out the documents that you think are relevant to establish um, your theory, and also to set out the documents that, um, and bad facts, the, the bad documents and the bad facts, and work them into your, into your theory so that you have um, something that a judge can understand as and a way of explaining both the good facts and the bad facts, um, and that you make sure that you provide it to the judge well in advance of the pretrial. I, I know there are still people who are not delivering their pretrial memo, memos in a timely fashion, and I've heard from many judges that they really do read these things, and they do read them sometimes um, well ahead of the pretrial. They like to have them, and they like to be able to think about the case so that they can bring more to the table than just giving you an opinion as to your uh, your likely chances of success or failure. And that the next point to that is that a pretrial now is a really wonderful way to settle a case if anyone has the interest. And we all know that the legal fees associated with pushing something forward to trial are huge these days, and that it's usually in your client's best interest, notwithstanding the wonderful legal theory you might have about a case if you can settle it early. And um, I've noted that many judges are extremely um, obliging about not only hearing the pretrial that y you start in on, but also inviting you back for several remedial sessions to see if you can't come to some conclusion and to try to bring the parties 
closer together as a, as a mediator would, um, and they'll explain to you, yes, this is your this is your uh, out likely outcome, um, and this is your likely outcome. This is how much it's going to cost to get there. Um, these are the things you should be worried about, um, and then try to uh, fashion a solution um, in that way. Um, and there have been cases where I've had eight continued sessions of pretrial um, with Mr. Justice Lissaman, uh, where the settlement was ultimately concluded. So um, I would use the, uh, the tool, the pretrial tool that's available to you, um, and I prefer if we can use the tool when the clients are invited to participate, particularly we, where you have a difficult client who thinks that you know, it's a slam dunk and they've seen LA law and you know, this should all happen and suddenly they should get paid. Well, um, the experience as we all know is not quite that. You can get a judgment and then there can be appeal after appeal and um, it ends up looking bad on you if they don't end up getting their money. So they might talk tough and whenever I hear it's the principle of the thing, I go, oh no. And I really wanna take those clients along to the pretrial. And similarly, if you have a, your colleague on the other side has a difficult client, I, I suggest to them that we might try to sit down with the clients, with the pretrial judge, uh, and do the pretrial with everybody there, um, and it takes it away from the legal focus of the theory of the case somewhat. It's still in the background, but it moves it more towards a mediated um, settlement of the issues. So that, that dovetails then into mediations, which are um, another kind of animal, and there's been two types that have Develop. There's the rights-based mediation and the interest-based mediation. A rights-based mediation is much like a pretrial and is usually um, in front of a retired judge. And um, the retired judge will often have um, a pretty clear regard for the theory, the, the competing theories of a client's case or your client's case and the opposite party's case, and will. Um, I think in their own mind make a decision based on that, but since they are now retired and their mandate is to mediate, they also want to get a solution because they want to establish a good reputation as being a good mediator and have repeat business and all that sort of thing. So they try to, even though they're legally trained and they have an opinion about your case, they try <laughs> to stay away from that and to take you into separate rooms. I'm sure some of you have done mediations before where they sort of beat you up about the theory of your case. Um, and that's always very unpleasant, but it's, it's a good eye opener as well. And if you're doing your first mediation, you think, oh, geez, you know, this isn't going well, you know, oh, what are we gonna do? And uh, then after you're all done and, you know, it's worked out okay, you and your, your colleague who was on the other side get together and you what did he tell you? And, you know, what did they, and it turns out they've been sort of beating you both over the head at the same time and your clients are getting more, you know, nervous as the thing goes on because um, the client's also getting this bad news. And then when you're all back together, he doesn't let, like, anyone know anything about what he thinks about your, your position. So you're all sort of, okay, and then you get really tired and you're tired of being beaten up and you don't want any more stale donuts and bad coffee and nor does your client and they realize oh god a third day of mediation at how many dollars an hour and I have a project I have to get to and lo and behold the parties come to some settlement um, and that's that's the one type of mediation that you can experience and um, it can be very unpleasant I mean people think of mediation as somehow soft and you know cozy um, I think that is completely false um, and in particular, if you're doing rights-based mediation and if you choose a retired judge or someone with legal training. Now, interest-based mediation, um, I've been to a few of those too. That's sort of more soft and comfy and you, you, they start out by saying, no, let's not say anything nasty to each other and let's try to keep this, you know, cooperative and uh, we'll try to find some mutual ground. And, you know, it, it is a little more pleasant, but usually what uh, I found in that case is that um, the party, the client, has some steam they want to let off, and the, the forum isn't good. So finally, the steam builds, and then your client does a banana brain um, and completely rips the, you know, to shreds the other, the other client. Um, and, and conversely, 10 minutes later, his, you know, or her cork blows. And, and so when that's all done, then everyone gets back to this touchy-feely thing, and you try to find, okay, how can we save, uh, save face, um, get to a solution that's going to make everybody happy. And in that context, the theory of the case is really not that useful. 
Um, the only useful guide um, that it can provide is like a benchmark as to, well, what's my worst case scenario if I, if I end up having to go to trial on this? Am I going to be successful or am I not? In interest-based mediation, they often don't even tell you what they think would happen there. They'll say that, you know, that's not the object of the exercise. Um, that is the mediator. So you can, get, you can get to the same result, but in two different ways. Um, and um, the theory of the case is a lot more um, powerful and useful a tool um, with a retired judge or someone with legal training as opposed to someone who's um, a, an interest-based mediator who is looking to find a solution and it doesn't really matter the strength or the weakness of the case particularly. Um, I had a mediation um, with one of the retired judges where we acted for um, a canola oil producer who had sold um, about a million and a half dollars worth of oil to uh, an NGO, which is like a nonprofit governmental organization that distributes, distributes it, um, on behalf of one of the very large um, children's charities. And as it turned out, the fellow in the middle, the NGO, was a rogue and had taken the $1.5 million that the children's charity had given him and had gone off to Tunisia or something with it um, and bought commuter, computer equipment. I mean, I think he thought he was Robin Hood, but at the end of the day, that's, that's not how, um, how it panned out. And so, of course, my client was hopping up and down mad. They wanted their $1.5 million. The ultimate uh, party responsible in law was the, the children's charity. But everyone felt kind of sick about this whole process, except my client, who really just wanted their money. They didn't care when we went to the mediation and the, um, the head of the charity came and explained how many children would starve as a result of this money having to be repaid. And I was just ill. I thought, what a horrible case to be on. And I really am not enjoying this. And the, the judge, of course, um, or the retired judge, um, you know, knew in law that we were correct. But he also, I think, felt fairly compelled in an equitable sense about this poor children's charity. So ultimately, we sat for four days in various boardrooms, eating bad donuts and drinking coffee and caucusing and trying to come to a solution. And um, the, the judge, to his credit, finally took my client alone into a room. And I'm not entirely sure what he said to them. But they, they came back out and they settled for a lot less money than they would have. Um, and so the charity saved itself about seven hundred thousand um, dollars, and my client got present value. They brought along their accountant, and so the way it worked out was the the accountant could figure out very quickly the present value of getting the eight hundred or nine hundred thousand now, um, as opposed to waiting however long the judge said it would be if we went on and went through a trial and an appeal and so forth. And he said, and um, he also used the bad facts make bad law thing, um, and that if he was hearing the case, he would probably try to find a way to support the charity. So anyway, that's settled, but it, um, it again is an example of a rights-based mediator um, being influenced because we're human about the, the equities of the case. So the theory of the case is usually helpful in rights-based, but in that circumstance, it really was the, you know, the un unusual fact circumstance that fashioned the solution. Um, so the theory of the case, I know all of my colleagues have taken you through what the theory of the case is and how to, how to distill it and uh, when, when you might have to think about it again. And um, that's the last sort of area of comment I want to make is both after you're done mediation and pretrial, you may come to realize as a result of exchanged um, memoranda both in mediation and in pretrial uh, conferences and the exchange of information that you might have missed a theory or you're way off base with your theory, in which case, you know, you have to, to change hats and fairly quickly. Um, and well, I, I agree with my friend's comment that it's good to know your theory and to work it through right from the pleadings. Um, my colleague in this file that I've shown you was extremely successful having little or no theory and coming up with a theory sort of at the trial um, that won the case. I mean, it didn't prevail at, at the Court of Appeal, but there are not many clients who want to go on and spend the money to go to Court of Appeal. So um, uh, I guess um, 
my comment there is if you can't, if you haven't got it right, it's better to get it right and accept the fact that your transcripts are going to be little of little or no use um, than not amend um, and change the theory um, and, and lose. Um, but, and my own, my own personal comment on um, all of the stuff to do with theory is that the theory of the case is very nice, but um, what your client is looking for is a, a good solution for a reasonable price in a reasonable time frame. So, um, you know, there aren't that many clients that are interested in A, paying for, or B, participating in all of the legal niceties to, you know, uh, marshal a case forward to be the ideal case presented to trial and so forth. So, um, if you've got the great case and the great client, all this stuff is great. If not, use your practical common sense to, to work out a solution. And, and the last comment is that I think as uh, members of the bar, we should try to deal with each other in a um, more friendly basis or on a more friendly basis than I've noted has been happening over the past number of years. And I think it would both enhance our reputation in the community and with our clients if we worked to do uh, reasonable solutions to problems as opposed to this um, old-fashioned uh, full-dress battle uh, routine. So those are my comments. Thanks. Sure. And there are different theories, and the, it all depends on the case, the amount in issue, the parties, and so forth. But I believe in, in mediation well before you've even, you know, uh, got past, much past the demand letter. And um, the reason I say that is it wouldn't be the same type of mediation. It wouldn't be so rights-based. It wouldn't be the theory of the case. You wouldn't have every document in its uncle. You wouldn't have, you know, marshaled all your facts. You're kind of going a little bit into more of an interest-based mediation, a little, um, div divorcing yourself a little from the theory of the case and the technical legal uh, view of things. And I find that my clients, because I act for secured creditors and lenders most of the time, they prefer that approach at the first instance, and then if that doesn't work, then we can decide, are we going to keep going? And for that type of mediation, there are a lot of mediators who uh, you can get for a good rate, who are not going to comment on the, the legal position of the parties, but more sit down and help you keep tempers cool and look at it factually. How much is it going to cost each of you to go forward to this step compared to what can we do now? And, you know, I found those to be very successful. Um, Mediation, so I don't, I don't necessarily agree with the wisdom that you wait until you know you've duked it out a bit in the litigation before you mediate. It all depends on the facts, and you know you have to use your judgment. And also, if you're repeat repeat clients, you'll get to know what your clients' preferences are. Some clients just abhor going to trial, and most of them that I know do. I don't care who they are. Nobody wants to go to trial. No one wants to do discoveries. No one wants to find documents. So if you can kind of appeal to that along the continuum, you'll find the ultimately good.
good spot to stop. And it doesn't have to be, you know, the 10-day mediation with, you know, piles of documents. Well, and that's unfortunate, and that goes right. And that goes back to my whole: uh, as members of the bar, I think we have to raise our level of conduct a notch, and that we have to start dealing with things in a more common sense, um, decent human being approach. And that um, if you've got somebody on the other side who's being fairly difficult or obstreperous, um, it often shows that they they're coming from a, sign, a point of weakness. Um, and they're trying to, um, you know, make as much money out of the file as they can, uh, to put it bluntly, so. The problem is that civil lawyers are the crown. Ah, right. So it's just always a catch and balance. Mm -hmm. But you don't have the strength that just enforcement and civil mediation. Well, I guess what I do in that case is I set out a fairly good letter that, that it, it is sort of an offer of settlement and make sure that they have reviewed that with their client and try to get a face-to-face -face meeting with you um, and their client and the lawyer as soon as possible to try to you know, bring things down a bit and also so that you can get a first chance to explain to the plaintiff that, yo, you'll get a lot more money in your pocket if we do a deal now than if you wait and have to pay you know, my, um, my loudspeaker here, uh, 150000 So that's my view. Okay, well, th thank you again, uh, Ms. Gray. I appreciate that, and uh, it's very, very helpful. Um, we're going to take a, a ten-minute break at this point, um, and uh, then come back for a final speaker, uh, uh, David Bristow, uh, QC. So, thank you, Elaine.